Tehát... People will be coming in, so I won't do my formal introduction yet. Are you going to be sure. tweeting about this patent? Is that <laughs> why you were asking? I think multitasking would be dangerous, but yes, I, I'm going to use every social media skill I have uh, eventually. Oh, but not not right at this moment. You're not going to be okay. I think talking and tweeting at the same time would be <laughs> dangerous. <laughs> yes, well, that's that's what I try to do. I try to operate in that realm of social media danger, which <laughs> that's that's my that's my level of of uh, of risk. I'll leave that to you, and I'll leave that into your good hands. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I'm sure that people are coming into the room now. I'm just going to open up my little chat column so I can see uh, if people are coming in. And uh, also, if we have the participants listening, there we go. So I do see that we have some people coming into the room. So I want to welcome everybody. Hello, my name is Jay Frost. And if you're new to this, this little uh, patch of woods, um, this is the Philanthropy Mastermind series brought to you by Donor Search. So this is not a commercial for donor search, but I definitely want to give a commercial uh, for the company because without them, uh, we couldn't have this fun and bring people like Patton to you today, which I'll be introducing. Uh, I'll be introducing him to you in a moment in case he's new to you. But this platform is something where we've been offering discussions with thought leaders in the field of philanthropy and fundraising since 2016. And the exciting part of that, I think, is that we also get to talk with you. Now, we don't get to do that literally, meaning that we cannot see you and we cannot hear you. But we have a couple ways for you to interact today. And you're familiar with us from Zoom, from other Zoom meetings that you've been chained to your desk to have the last two years. One of them is, of course, chat. And I want to encourage you to utilize that. The other, of course, is uh, the Q&A, which you can look at as more a formal place to list a question. Um, and it, it, what I would suggest is this. Let's use the chat as a way for you to talk amongst yourselves or to talk with us. You can feel free to make a comment or a question chat along the path, but also feel free to use Q&A so that when we get through some of the uh, conversation that we plan to have in the next few minutes, we'll have a storehouse of things that we can bring into the discussion. So please use both those forms as a way for you to participate. We do wanna hear from you. And this discussion is one that pertains to all of our work in the not-for-profit sector, uh, which of course is the subject of leadership. So today, uh, of course, we have as our guest right here, you can see uh, Pat McDowell, who is, uh, or I should say Dr. Pat McDowell, I'm not sure if you use that moniker, but he is um, an MBA and a CFRE to boot. Uh, he is, of course, a nonprofit expert, author, speaker, and coach, among many things. He leads the PMA Nonprofit Leadership, a consulting practice, which he founded after a very successful 20-year career in fundraising, especially in higher ed fundraising, where he was working um, among other institutions. Uh, and let me see, I know, well, you worked at the Special Olympics, of course, uh, but then you were leading uh, teams at public and private universities, uh, North Carolina and beyond. He is, as I said, a master um, of a trainer for AFP International as well as the CFRE, um, and has received his BA from UNC Chapel Hill an MBA from Queens University of Charlotte and a doctorate from the University of Southern California. So he knows his stuff inside and out, both as a practitioner and as uh, someone who studied this sector with that objectivity, which we all crave. So thank you so much for being here, Patton. We really appreciate you. Jay, it's a pleasure. Looking forward to this conversation and uh, thank you again for the opportunity. Well, it's, it's a pleasure to have you. And this is kind of a roadshow in a way because you've just released a book. So before we go any further, I want people to know about the book. So can you introduce the title and tell people a little bit about it? Uh, thank you, Jay. It's called Your Path to Nonprofit Leadership, which is also the title of my podcast. So I couldn't get very creative, but I went with the same phrase that represents, I know what you and I are going to talk about, but it's intended as a field guide for nonprofit professionals, both those wanting to get into the field and those wanting to advance, and hopefully they'll find it helpful. And it's not um, a fixed point in time. Leadership is an always evolving thing. I mean, you've addressed that so true. in the book, you'll address that in our discussion today. But when you say you have a podcast on the subject, it's not like a listen once and you're done because <laughs> nonprofit leadership has evolved since you've been a leader in the nonprofit field, right? Indeed. And I'm fortunate to have people like you, by the way, who are going to join me on the podcast. And I've been able to talk to now 150 nonprofit leaders from around the world. And you are exactly right. The evolution of leadership in our sector uh, continues to move forward. So these conversations allow me to hopefully 
stay kind of on the lead edge of this topic. Right. And, and well, that's the right place to start always is with the why. So can you tell us why this is important and why is it a challenge, particularly now in our sector? Yeah, it's a great place to start. I've been fortunate, as you mentioned, starting with my work at Special Olympics International back when Eunice Kennedy Shriver was the oh, wow. founder and still yeah. running the organization, the global movement. Right. So I saw outstanding leadership up close. But what has inspired me over the years since then, yes, the, the excellent leaders was a motivation for the book, but the challenge of so many nonprofit professionals who you and I both run into, Jay, yeah. they are motivated by the cause, but maybe frustrated about, I don't know how to move forward. And so that comes for a variety of reasons, some of which is, frankly, our sector doesn't do a great job onboarding, orienting, or providing professional development, I think, for many of these talented newcomers to the field, and therefore, they have to find their own way in terms of a path for leadership. Uh, at the risk of sounding like Brian Gumble, he used to do this whole thing where he'd say, why, why? I really do need to ask I'm you ready. why. I mean, you've been here for a long time doing this. Why is it that we haven't, I mean, beyond all the things we need to do, why is it that people haven't said we need to do it? Yeah, I, I, well, I hope you and I are going to inspire a better answer. I think historically, however, again, um, we do a lot with the little in the nonprofit sector. Most mm. of the funding goes to programming, and I have no objection to that. But we wonder why there's turnover. We wonder why people don't stay in the field. I think generally speaking, and there are certainly exceptions, but for the sake of being provocative, the sector does not do a good job providing professional development. And the sector ironically needs talent to both join the sector and advance in it. But often when the budget is tight, and you know this, marketing gets cut, some of the quote extraneous expenses, including yeah. professional development. And then the vicious cycle begins. We don't fund it. And yet we learn over and over from studies that what people want, in addition to compensation, of course, they want professional development. And so we don't give it to them, they leave. And then our organizations are in a constant, I think, vicious cycle trying to maintain. And are you talking about all levels of leadership? I mean, in other words, uh, both staff leadership, but also even the volunteer leadership of the board, because I, yeah. I seem to hear those questions too. It's a great point, yes. I think, again, there are deficiencies at every level. When I was putting the book together, I had kind of three distinct pipelines, if you will, of talent. And I imagine many of the listeners right now fall in one of these categories. Um, one is the emerging leader, the, you know, the young professional, maybe coming out of college and, and looking for an opportunity, an inroad into our, our sector. Um, but often coming to me, again, anecdotally, when I talk to these talented young professionals, they're like, how do I navigate this? How do I get that first job? How do I advance and build a, a career here and not a temporary stop on the path? Um, there's also, Jay, a lot of the, what I would call the kind of mid-career plateau professionals. They like the field, they've been in it 10 years, but there's nowhere up. A small organization, the latter, frankly, may be blocked by someone who's not going anywhere. And they're like, I love the field, I wanna stay, but I am ready for something else. How do I find that path? And then the third one is, is the increasing number and get, you know, speaking of the pandemic, um, the great resignation has brought thousands, if not millions <laughs> of what I would call potential lateral entries into nonprofit. Hmm. I'm sick of working at the bank. I wanna do something more rewarding. Maybe I, my skills will transfer. Now, again, that good intention doesn't mean it will work, but I do think that is a pipeline of talent we ought to at least consider. And my hope was that the book would also provide someone like that. All right, what do I need to do to transfer my skills into nonprofit? And then final point there is, Jay, what I'm hoping that this, our conversation creates uh, more interest for the leaders that need to be recruiting and retaining all three of those pipelines. In other right. words, if nonprofit leaders aren't sensitive to the talent pipeline, they will struggle. And I hope maybe this will give them some ideas. Well, and, and I, when I was asking that kind of clumsy question to, at the beginning about, uh, is this a moving target? Are we, you know, uh, all is, the, are we never stepping the same river twice um, over the years as things change? That's particularly true now. And you just mentioned the great resignation. And 
I'm wondering if that that opportunity is also a risk, right? That um, that if we have an opportunity to welcome a lot of people who might have been unhappy with that job at the bank, as you said, now come and work with us in making a better community. Uh, we love bankers too, but that's it's a different <laughs> it's a different thing. But what isn't that also a potential risk that some people who are with us in um, you know early stage of their career that they out. are also kind of frustrated with that lack of a ladder and that they, that we could risk losing them. Okay, it's a great point. And yes, um, what I'm hoping, and, and while obviously the current economy may slow it down a bit, the nonprofit sector has been growing largely at a pretty dramatic rate over the last 10 years. So I would suggest there's more opportunity than limitations for any of these talent pipelines. And, and so the organizations that are focused on that are likely growing um, and need additional talent. And I think there's space for all, but I think you have to be intentional about developing your own professional development plan, regardless of what path you ride in on. And you said it well, Jay, it is an ongoing. In fact, that's a characteristic I would say, maybe at the top of my list for the most successful nonprofit leaders is an intentional commitment to lifelong learning. You, you don't arrive. And sadly, some of those folks that are gonna get displaced I think kind of reach a plateau and then they just sit still and they are going to get passed by someone else. So that's, and, and is that affecting any particular group of these three, like the mid-career folks or is it everybody? I, I think it applies to everybody. You know, yeah. the mid-career, um, again, we can talk about that. I think there's some ways they can uh, address that, but if they sit still, they're going to get passed. But if yeah. they look for opportunities to cross train, and continue their education and maybe slightly different ladders, if you will, they'll have more options. But those- you know, that... I didn't, I, 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 oh, I'm sorry. I was gonna say, I, uh, I didn't set up a poll for this, but would have been great to have asked uh, the oh, audience- Where they come from? It, yeah, wh where they are in their own trajectory. And I know it's a little bit of self-definition here, but um, I'd be very interested to know uh, for those who are sitting in today to use the chat maybe for this, yeah, if you just let point. us know where you are, if you're emerging uh, mid-career, if you're a lateral entry, if, if you're willing to talk about that, we'd love to hear from you, um, as well as maybe where you are. I mean, I, I, are some of the things you're talking about, Patton, are they happening everywhere in the country or are they I, in a I think so. subsector? Yeah. And, and again, I've been fortunate. Again, the pandemic uh, obviously forced all of us into a virtual connectivity and what we've done is taken our mastermind program into a virtual environment, which is basically small group coaching, but mm -hmm. it's allowed us to interact with nonprofit leaders from all over the country. And yeah. so I, that's why I felt like, you know, yeah, I'm hearing from my friend in Los Angeles or one in Portland or one in Columbus, Ohio, and down in Florida. These themes seem to be prevalent in just about every community in which we've connected. And every subsector as well. I mean, whether it's the arts or uh, higher ed or Yes. Now, again, the arts and culture, I think, sector you and I talked about took a, the, the, the hardest hit during the pandemic mm -hmm. in terms of staffing. You know, as many as I think we lost 12 and a half million positions to largely the arts and culture sector, but not all sectors were impacted from a professional standpoint. But I think there's encouragement about the comeback that's available. And again, I think if you position yourselves well, there are, there are opportunities out there. I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina, and the job board is lighting up. And so those that have the requisite skills and experience, I think are going to be well positioned. That's such a great reminder. And for those who are looking and seeing this is one way to think about that search, I'm sure we can revisit that towards the end. But I do want to acknowledge there are a bunch of people who are commenting here. So we really appreciate you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we're hearing things indeed. like seasoned professional, mid-career, emerging leader in Western Penn, uh, seasoned professional with over 25 years of experience. That's definitely seasoning. So more power to you. Um, merging in from political fundraising. Boy, we could do a whole session on that. Uh, Speaking of lateral entries. Yep. Yes, exactly. Because these, these are different things. Political fundraising is not exactly a mirror of, uh, of our work here. Uh, a lot of great experience there. Mid-career plus 10 years. Um, so let's six years in. Lots of different kinds of experience. And it looks like around the country as well. Um, are you seeing some generalized trends in terms of some of this, this, uh, uh, the, the changes, especially 
uh, current and post COVID, if if we can even think about a post COVID world, uh, that uh, that are, you're watching and that you think will then influence what kinds of things we can do to help people make that that uh, that uh, climb up the leadership ladder. Yeah, I, I think again for the frustration we all feel about the isolation and the the virtual kind of limitations of communication, it also offers opportunities. And so I've seen positive things, for example, um, first on the board side, you know, now not everybody wants to be in a Zoom world forever, but I've seen organizations that have utilized the technology, particularly with engaging board meetings, mm -hmm. that you're getting people involved that aren't local. And it allows you to tap resources outside of your community, which, by the way, has also opened up professional opportunities for nonprofits in more rural communities who do not have a talent pipeline perhaps as strong locally, but organizations are finding, you know what, maybe I could have a marketing communications person who is one time zone away, you know, or maybe, uh, you know, they're not local, but again, we could dive into this, Jay, for a long time, but the, the ability to have remote work, you know, yes, we want everybody back in the office, but does it offer opportunities perhaps for you as a talented professional to get a job with an organization that maybe is not in your community, and as a nonprofit leader, could you utilize talent outside of your community because of this technology? That leads to the larger point, as a nonprofit leader going forward, you do have to understand the dynamic of remote technology, remote work. And that is maybe one highlight I'd lift up. Yeah, are you running into organizations that's, that have not made a commitment to tackling that if in fact they haven't tackled it already? Yeah, and, and it's, it's, it's a hiring deficiency. In other words, I'm seeing nonprofits leverage their flexibility as a competitive advantage. I can't pay you as much, but I can give you flexibility. Now, again, granted, there's some organizations where you have to have somebody come in to you know, provide the programming. So I'm not sure. saying every job is remote, but I have seen give or take other variations where talented, talented professionals are looking for flexibility and more nonprofits, frankly, are using that as a marketing tool. Hey, work with us. We will allow you some flexibility. And again, I, I worry about some organizations, again, higher ed friends I have that the, the institution saying everybody has to come back to work and people are saying, no, thanks. I'll go right. work somewhere else. Right, absolutely, and this and this is a recruitment and a retention tool. Exactly. Um, yeah. Well, even um, I promised I wouldn't talk too much about donor search. I won't. But I just a little window within the company is that they've been able to expand staff pretty dramatically. They needed to for a variety of of, of reasons. They, there was more desire for for products and services during this growth of philanthropy. Um, but they've also been able to use that as an opportunity to do recruitment everywhere. And, and, and they're not unique in that, I, that um, the, the needs of the companies that serve our sector are such that they've been able to start reaching out and, and retaining, uh, recruiting and retaining talent from all over the place. Um, I, but I'm seeing or at least feeling a little bit of um, reeling back of that. Are, are you sensing that as well as yes. organizations say, you better come back to the office? Is that something that we're experiencing too? Uh, absolutely. And I get it. I mean, the, the, the pendulum will swing back, but we don't want to be locked in our office forever. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the answer lies in the middle. And I'm hearing more organizations saying, you know what, we're going to allow people to work from home Monday and Friday, but we want them to come in Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Or there are right. certain mutually agreed upon days in the office so that we will get the interaction. But the flexibility beyond the required days, uh, I think mitigates that. Some people are comfortable with it. And again, back to board members, Jay, I'm finding a lot of them are saying, you know what? I, I love the organization, but I can't make every meeting, especially if I'm an hour away. So by having the hybrid access, I'm, I'm staying more engaged. But anyway, long answer to your question. I think hybrid where possible is a good answer. Right. Um, it's a... It's, uh... It's surprising to me that some organizations are still resisting or trying to go back to kind of an old normal, but I guess that's just human nature. We do have some questions in here, and one is interesting because it's so specific, and I know we're not talking all about HR issues here today, Pat, <laughs> right. but this, this did surprise me about 
one of the challenges for remote work is how many nonprofits will pay for cell phone and Wi-Fi usage at home, which is such a small expense. I know that little things add up. My wife tells me that she's right, but it's true that um, the cell phone bill, I mean, we have unlimited minutes. If we need to talk to donors or staff or volunteers, we need to be able to talk. It, it, are these kinds of things, are they also still impediments yeah, for hiring? Yes. And, and again, I applaud the cost consciousness that we as nonprofit of stewards of donors' money, right, have to be. But I would argue, yeah, pay for the phone bill because <laughs> the cost of turnover is 10 times that phone bill. And, sure. and that's like, we, I think we need to remind leadership, maybe it's your board or even your executive director that's saying, no, we're not going to pay for the phone bill. I think that's short-sighted. And yeah. if we can retain your talent and by paying your phone bill, to me, that's a no-brainer. And we do have other comments and questions coming in. So I want to make sure I do some of it dynamically sure. as well as continued conversation. One came in a little earlier about being from a small shop. And uh, she said, we have the option to remote work if needed. We're paid money towards cell. And the organization provides Good. a laptop. Wi-Fi is not covered. Um, but it, and then someone else talked about how this is a huge issue, especially when one doesn't have great Wi-Fi coverage. So one of the other dimensions of this, we don't want to uh, uh, be too cavalier about it, is that not everybody has equal access to not just the technology, the budget for it, but in fact, internet connection, high speed, which has been an impediment to kind of the to go back into the nonprofit leadership piece, your ability to communicate effectively with members of your team, whether they're follow, fellow volunteers or from a staff member to a leader in your shop or what have you, if you're on one of those uh, kind of crazy connections where you're cutting out all the time, it's, it's almost worse than being caught with, you know, a big mug and wearing pajamas. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's not a way to work. Here's a thought though, Jay, what I've seen, I think there's increasing awareness in the funder community of this challenge. And they can understand if you make a good case that the efficiency of their investment in hotspot equipment, technology, to the extent possible. And I realize there are rural communities that are struggling. Although I've seen large scale investment, of course, to expand broadband connectivity in rural communities. So there may be funders in your region that could appreciate if we can better connect these kind of human service organizations in particular, they'll pay for it. And I would say, again, if you're in a small nonprofit, you're struggling with this, I bet you've got a donor that could appreciate the value relatively small investment, but if it is indeed the budget cost you're worried about, try some donors and see if they might invest because they could feel the, the goodwill of that tangible investment helping you do your job. Right. And, and once again, I know that we didn't mean to get into the nooks and crannies of budgeting here <laughs> per se, but right. we've, we've both been in environments where, especially in higher ed, where you travel a lot to see donors and that adds up. So the travel costs have been somewhat mitigated in the last two years. And we have choices to make about how much we can and should do virtually that benefits our institutions and our donors. And we might find some cost savings there that could then be applied to some of these other things you're talking about. Excellent point. And I, um, donors, I think, are more receptive. They're Zooming with their grandkids right now. They're right. comfortable in the technology. Now, again, you want to get you know, in person where and as much as possible, but maybe you don't have to look at the same travel budget you did before. Right, right. Um, okay, so going back to this key issue, tell us a little bit about what nonprofit leadership looks like. I think the best ones, I'll give you three things, three characteristics to consider that I believe, and again, I'm being intentionally provocative, but hey, these folks <laughs> wouldn't be dialing in if they didn't want to be <laughs> thinking. Um, a, a, they have to embrace lifelong learning. I had a, a 62 year old, very talented executive director in our first mastermind, and he was the epitome of this. He could rest on his laurels. He has had an amazingly accomplished career, but he just said, Patton, I realized that as soon as I stop embracing the lifelong learning, I, I'm not going to one, enjoy the work, and I'm not going to be as successful. And mm -hmm. because the sector changes too quickly. So the best leaders have to embrace that. You never arrive, you never graduate. You just keep learning. Um, the second thing is I think we have to acknowledge the increasing complexity of the organization. You know, when I came in 30 years ago in Special Olympics, I was purely a program guy <laughs> and hopefully a decent one, uh, but I guess the, the jury's still out on that, right? But 
I realized to advance in our sector, it is just as complex as for-profit businesses. And I would argue even more complex because we have less resources, less personnel, and we have the nuances of a lot of volunteer-driven activity, you know, so we can't uh, incentivize employees when they're volunteers the same way. Um, and we deal with the somewhat difficult governance of having to report to a 12, 15, 20, or 30 member volunteer board of directors. That is tricky for nonprofit leadership. So what I'm saying is we have to embrace the complexity of nonprofit leadership. And we're going to have to multitask. In fact, that's the third thing the best nonprofit leaders doing, they're cross-training. Okay. You, if you're on the program side, good for you. It's a strength but you're gonna to need to understand the finance and business office people as well. You're gonna to need to understand fundraising. You're gonna to need to understand the different elements. And so leaders that are open to that complexity and are willing to embrace the lifelong learning, those are the ones I think that are gonna excel. And you're gonna make yourself marketable as a leader, almost regardless of whether the environment changes because you are adept. Is there a resistance to that cross-training piece still? I mean, because it, it would seem to me that in many organizations, if you're not very familiar with program, it's going to be hard to raise money. And if yes. you're over in the program side and you need money to operate your program, whether it's sponsored research in university or whether it's logistics at you know uh, some kind of food dispensary, a social service agency, that in either case, you, you have to know what's going on the other side. If there's some giant wall. I don't know how you can get anything done. Where's the resistance? Yeah, I, I mean, I guess I myself might have been naive, you know, 15 years ago that, well, if I'm a really, really good fundraiser, I probably could get a job as an executive director because fundraising is so important. And I'm like, okay, partially, but I don't agree with that logic just for the reason you said, Jay. Yes, mm -hmm. I need to be an effective fundraiser as an executive director, but you're right. I need to understand the mechanics of programming. I need to understand the finance and the unique kind of financial models that many of our nonprofits have. Think about the complexity of grant funding versus philanthropic dollars uh, versus earned revenues that many oh, yeah. nonprofits have and government funding, everything else. So if I'm not at least competent in that financial area, I don't care how good a fundraiser I am. I think eventually that could be a challenge. Yeah, it's, it's, it's so funny that you mentioned that because one part is just that understanding of how these pieces work and they're becoming more complex all the time. Uh, obviously, we have cryptocurrency now, uh, which is, I know we've had it for a while. Don't anybody slam me for that. Right, right, but, right. but in terms of a, a vehicle that, that organizations are taking more care to, uh, to attract and be able to uh, make use of, uh, that's also true with now with NFTs. Um, and if yes. you don't know what I'm talking about with these things, we'll have another session on it. But but that's but that kind of thing is is additionally complex. It's much more than what we've had to deal with prior. I think I couldn't agree more. And I that's literally a topic I put on my personal annual plan for the year ahead. In other words, as an example of the lifelong learning, I think we all need to embrace. I use kind of a higher ed analogy and say, what are you going to study next semester? And Great. these semesters yeah. never end. And I would say cryptocurrency is something we all ought to take an elective in, at least, if not a full course, because it's going to be around to stay. And so to me, it's like we should all be thinking about what are the topics we need to learn. Right. And in fact, I was going to ask you about that. When you talk about embracing lifelong learning as a concept, it's it's something that I, I hope that people take that take that to heart. But then putting it to practice is more than an issue of whether or not the organizations will encourage professional development. It's also making that kind of plan that you have established for yourself. Not all of us have um, have that clear in our minds. You mentioned, speaking of minds, a mastermind group. And when we've talked privately, you've talked about that too. So uh, first of all, the Philanthropy Mastermind Series is just a way to bring people in and talk with us. But the mastermind group that you're talking about is a bit different. And I've heard other people working with groups like this and know other people in them. Could you, would you mind talking a bit about the value, the utility of that, either ones that you participate in or have participated in, how that can help, especially with this lifelong learning component? Absolutely. And it, it, um, it the, the book, in essence, I put into practice through our mastermind leadership program. So it's not just fundraising or philanthropy. Our mastermind is intended as a overall leadership development. 
And certainly fundraising and philanthropy is an important part of any nonprofit leader's ultimate destination. But I believe there are many other aspects. And so the seven stops on the path that we can talk about in the book are literally the curriculum, if you will, for our mastermind. And a mastermind, for those who don't know, is in essence a small group, in this case, virtual leadership development, where we learn from each other. I serve as the facilitator, but I'm quick to point out, when you bring talented and motivated people together in any kind of small group setting, good things happen. Yeah. And what I'm trying to do, and my colleague Lee Williams, we're just trying to provide a framework and give these people things to talk about, work on their own plan, Mm -hmm. but then compare notes, hold each other accountable, offer resources to each other. And so again, there are some mastermind groups that can go on for years. We have a kind of four month program that allows this to develop, but it's what you said, Jay, it's a perfect way for lifelong learning. They make a new networking kind of companions out of this group and they're cross sectors but we find there are more similarities than differences. And that's what our mastermind is, is all about. And I do want to go back to that because people might ask, well, how do I find a group like that? Whether it's you or someone else, how do I know that it's the right one for me, which is a different question, um, et cetera. But you talked about the seven keys and I know that was in the title of the session. So we're finally getting there for those who have been that's patient. Fine. Um, can you talk about uh, what's, you know, these, these seven elements that you think are so essential to nonprofit leadership that you cover yeah, in the book? Absolutely. Well, and to answer your previous question, again, and including our program, talk to someone that's been through a mastermind. You know, that's the best source. As much as I'm biased, of course, I'm going to encourage people to check ours out. But talk to someone that's been through it because there are different styles, different approaches, different size groups. So you need to find a mastermind that fits you. But to me, it's an important point that regardless of where you do it, it's one of the seven elements we'll talk about in a minute. Um, You need to find, I think, an ongoing uh, strategic connections. You need to network strategically, not just in your organization, your community. The best leaders find connectivity across their community, across their state, across the country. So Mm -hmm that to that point. But in terms of these concepts, and again, what we, we use the mastermind to talk about, the, the very first one is getting clarity about where you want to go. And, and I would use this comparison. Everyone listening to this webinar has been involved in a strategic planning exercise with their nonprofit, mm-hmm. right? And I, I'm often surprised that we don't apply the same strategic planning exercises for our own personal development. Like how many times have you sat through a terrible retreat, (laughs) you know, for hours or days or whatever. And I'm like, okay, if you did that for your nonprofit, spend some time on yourself. So for example, in chapter one, this, what I call sharpen your vision, we do a vision framework exercise. So it's not just kind of a pie in the sky. What do I want to do at, you know, the end of my career, but we're going to break it down. There's a worksheet. There are kind of six or seven component questions that you can ask yourself. And by the way, this is a worksheet I'm happy to share if anybody wants it, because it it helps define what you know, what you don't know. In other words, I'm in higher ed now. Would you consider going healthcare if the right job open? Would you go arts and culture? You know, or no, you kind of confirmed in your current sector. What about geography? Would you move for the right job? Are, and I noticed some of the chat, you know, some of you listening now are in small shops. Others of you maybe are with large institutions. No wrong answer. But if you're in a small shop, would you consider a large institution and vice versa? So, Jay, we have that kind of conversation, which I hope brings clarity to what unfortunately many coffee conversations I have with people. They're like, Patton, I'm just I'm just frustrated or I know I need to change, but I don't know what. And I'm like, all right, well, let's talk about it. what do you want? And it's okay if they're not paused about everything, but that's what led to this exercise. All right, let's break it down. Let's identify what is clear. Maybe you can't move because of your family commitments or yeah, I could move for the right opportunity. Then all right, we're going to build a plan around that. Right. right? And that's always so, changing too, right? I mean, that's exactly. once again, that's why these mastermind groups can go on for years or this process can be applied at every point in your career as well, right? Because Indeed. if you ask someone, what is it you're after today? It may be different next year certainly after we've gone through what we have collectively the last two years. I revisit it. I revisit it every year for the last 19 years. Right. You know, when I started doing some of these exercises, testing them myself. So you're right. 
I would, would not want someone to think, all right, I, I fill out the worksheet one time and I'm done. No, you will continue to be revisited, but I think you'll be sharper in your focus. Mm -hmm. And then, and we do have some people who are asking for the worksheet. So um, I, I know that let's, why don't we do this now? And then we can revisit again at the end. Uh, do you want to share uh, your, your URL um, and maybe an email address? Uh, happy to, Patton McDowell, myname.com, pattonmcdowell.com. And my email are, is my initials, pm at pattonmcdowell.com. So you can find me, find me on LinkedIn. I'm on there if that helps. And of course, our website, pattonmcdowell.com, you can find out more about the mastermind, the book, or the podcast if that is of interest. And happy to share. There are a couple of worksheets there on the book page. And then, of course, I'm happy to, to work with somebody. There, there are more than just two worksheets and each of the chapters. I was determined, Jay, not, not that I have anything against the history of leadership or philanthropy or the kind of deep research. I wanted to make sure this book was kind of like when we go to a conference, you want to have some takeaways. So I, I was yeah. determined each chapter is going to have something specific a thought exercise, a worksheet, an idea, hopefully you can take with you. And so the vision framework is an example of one of those uh, worksheets. Yeah, and that's just number one of the seven. Yes. So you want to take <laughs> us through it yeah. a little bit because, more and then we'll. <laughs> and, and yeah, again, thank you for allowing my excitement. I, I really am excited about this because I just see so much talent in our sector or talented individuals who want to do better in our sector. Right. And that's what drives me. You know, I want to see the outstanding talent of these individuals excel at nonprofit leadership. The sector needs you, right? So I hope that you can understand my enthusiasm. But the second one, map your course. Map your course, you know, fancy way for saying, all right, let's first self-assess. By the way, the best leaders, even the veterans, are always open to assessment. And I used a worksheet that I've kind of cultivated now over the years, but I believe there are 10 essential skills and experiences you need to excel in nonprofit leadership. So this worksheet literally lists them and we go through in our mastermind, we go through and kind of rate yourself. And by the way, don't beat yourself up because you're good at many of these 10. I'm sure of that. My guess is though, you're gonna divide the 10 into roughly thirds. You're gonna be strong at a third, you're gonna be competent at a third and you're gonna to need to work on a third. And so we talk about both, all right, you gotta get up to competent because I would suggest if you wanna be an executive director, you need to be competent in all 10, right? But those strengths that you have, Jay, like you mentioned earlier, if you're really strong on the program side, then let's leverage that. Or if you're a really good fundraiser, let's leverage that. And those are things we talk about so that, again, this doesn't become just theory, but, what are you gonna do next year to get better in those areas? And that, again, I'm looking at my, you know, we, all, we also talk one more concept there about mapping your course is being intentional about not just kind of, it's not just one long range, what do I wanna do 10 years from now? We break it down. What are you gonna do in one year, three years, five years? Right, right. You know, and, and adjust accordingly. Cause some people are like, Pat, I need a new job now. <laughs> I'm uh, all right. Well, I know your timeline. We need to uh, adjust the plan. Others are like, I love my job. I just want to get better someday so that I'll be positioned for senior leadership. Uh, Pat, I don't, I don't want to interrupt the flow because these are these are all these are really they're all keys. Um, but I'm wondering, as people go through this process, does it sometimes also make them not only more effective in figuring out where they want to go and getting there, whether it's internally or externally, but does it sometimes make them happier with the work that they're doing too? I mean, the person who says, I got to get out of my job it. now, do they sometimes find that actually their job can be a lot more satisfying if they just are in, better in tune with us? I'm glad you make that point because I think sometimes the, the implication of this coaching suggests I want you to leave your job or find a new job, right? right. And, right. and I'm glad you say that because many that I've worked with and coached, they just want that, Jay. They want more satisfaction. They want to do their job better. Right. And so they recognize that, hey, I, I'd like to have more opportunities to do things that I'm, I'm strong at, or I realize I've had some, some weaknesses maybe that kind of add stress to my work. 
Mm. And so it's amazing when someone uh, overcomes one of those weaknesses and like, now I can really do the mission motivating work and not because I've always been nervous about the budget and finance stuff. Classic example. You know, I'm nervous. My board member is going to ask me a question or a donor is going to ask me a question. I'm not totally comfortable about it. And then if we can find a way to help you overcome that and give you more confidence, uh, I think, Jay, you're exactly right. They love their work even more. It's a matter of getting in balance, I guess, at some Indeed. level. Every exactly day is leg right. day. Yeah. <laughs> and speaking but, of leg day, I know the third item on your list is about getting in shape. So... Yeah, and Ken, I always chuckle at that because that suggests I'm provide I'm some sort of fitness trainer. I'm like, no, I need to be out working my legs, my arms, or whatever you know <laughs> exercise I need. But I use the get in shape as a means to specifically sharpen and improve your leadership fitness. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so in that chapter, I get into some things. All right, yes, you need to take care of yourself physically. You know, you need to eat better and exercise and sleep better because an exhausted nonprofit leader will not be a successful nonprofit leader, right? <laughs> and so I, I'll, it, I'm only laughing I mean, because it's so common. This indeed, whole burnout concept. I'm worried about it, and yeah. that's why, again, in our mastermind, we talk about it not because I'm the expert, but I'm trying to get people to acknowledge if you stay up all night, night after night you are going to ultimately collapse. And, and by the way, as a nonprofit leader, you're not setting the example that your team needs. So we talk about what are you doing to give yourself a break? And what are you doing to set an example that others can follow and maintain a healthy balance? And so, but we also talk, Jay, about getting in shape organizationally. Uh, uh, yeah. One of the 10 skills that I alluded to in the earlier worksheet is that you have a personal kind of productivity uh, system. And I'm not telling you what app to use or how you do your to-do list. I am saying, however, you need to have a system that I can be assured, particularly if I'm trying to hire you as an executive director, I need to know things will not fall through the cracks, that you have a system to organize and prioritize and then get the right things done. And so we talk about that as a fitness concept, as a nonprofit leader, because trust me, the volume is only going to get more intense. You're going to have to manage more stuff, more emails, more messages, more content and all that. So if you're not kind of building a system to better accommodate that, it's quick to or easy to get overloaded. Boy, that's that's terrifying. There's a reason why you can only see this much of my desk. <laughs> yeah, why I'm the camera the is focused here. Me too. Uh, it's yeah. And, and that's, that's again, another thing that I'm sure contributes to, to burnout, right? If there is no totally. system, but how many people have a system? In fact, as you're going through all these things, I'm, I'm reminded of something, uh, like, uh, games that I used to play with my son or try to play. And he would always win, um, where the individual characters, um, whether it's a digital game or, or on cards like Pokemon cards, they have different characteristics, right? And different strengths and weaknesses, but they're not all equal. So as you're going through these things, sharpening your vision and mapping your course and getting in shape, it strikes me that somebody might be really good at one thing and need a lot of work on something like what you can't see on my desk. Uh, is that also a fair assumption? Great point. And, and I'll say again, we have to be careful. We're not we all have our challenges. Mm -hmm. And so I don't want anyone to feel like, wow, well, I guess I can't advance because I'm weak in this area. No, we're all weak at something and we can get, but we can get better. Mm -hmm. And so we hope that it's more a positive reinforcement. And by the way, the positive reinforcement, I, I find almost invariably nonprofit leaders have skills they're not fully maximizing. In other words, you're a good public speaker, Jay, and yet your organization maybe doesn't give you the chance to speak as much. So it's like, all right, how do we get you behind the podium, so to speak. And maybe it's not through your nonprofit, but the local AFP chapter could use you. And again, I know this is your, this is your forte. So that's an interesting example I'm using, right? But it's, it's there are others. Great example. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, or, or maybe, you know, you're a program person, but you do have financial acumen. You loved, you know, accounting and business in college. And I'm like, all right, Maybe you need to go to the finance committee meetings of your board and, and mm -hmm. get some experience mm -hmm. and interaction with those board members, which helps sharpen your skills. So 
again, back to your point, we're not here to beat you up for things you need to work on. We also need to lift up those things at which you're skilled. Okay. That makes sense. Now, I know you have several others. Do you want to take us through those? Yeah, um, and I, I'll be sensitive to your time too. And all of our, our listeners have to go yeah, back I want to make sure people too, have right? time for questions, <laughs> but they're all really important. And I, I have a cheat sheet, so I know they haven't heard it yet. And I'd love them to hear some of the other keys. Quick summary. And again, there's a chapter on each of these. So if, if they kind of strike a chord, know that I, I've tried to elaborate. But the next one I call curate knowledge. Curate knowledge. It's similar to the volume of, of information you all are having to absorb right now. I believe there are systems that you can set up to allow yourself better to accommodate all the information coming in, organize it. But here's the important thing and the toughest thing for all of us is finding time to, to read and learn. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I think we all have stuff in our inbox. I wish we had time to read it or open it, but I have a chapter devoted to this concept of curating knowledge, um, organizing the right information. So again, and you have to have some foresight around if I'm gonna be an executive director someday, someday maybe I need to start a file now on some of these topics that I don't need in my day-to-day -day job, but I will. Mm -hmm. Because, and here's an example, Jay, I've encouraged our masterminds to do, is to, to do job post searches. Even if you're not looking to move now, say, if I'm a program person and I wanna be an executive director someday, I should look at those job descriptions, right? What are current searches for executive directors looking for mm -hmm. and how do your skills and experiences stack up? And I think that could be a fascinating study. And I'm encouraging folks to start a file of that ideal job description you might want someday. What are they looking for? If they interviewed you today, how would you match up? And it might tell you, all right, I can see all these jobs are asking for strategic planning experience, or they want somebody to run a capital campaign, or they want, you know, fill in the blank skill. That helps you design your plan to someday be able to handle that call. So that's curate knowledge. Um, Jay, there's no one better to talk to than you about the next one, which is express yourself, communication. And what I'm doing is breaking down communication into component parts. You need to be able to write well. And I mean, you gotta do a handwritten note to your top donor, just as you need to organize an executive summary memo for your board chair, who's not gonna read anything beyond that. You need to be able to communicate in your newsletter in different ways you need to speak. You see where I'm going. What we do in that chapter is break down all the forms of what I would call leadership communication skills. You got to run a meeting. You, you need to do these things that require your communication skills. So anyway, I expand on that, but you're the one they should be talking to too on these communication no, skills and experiences as well. And I don't want to keep interrupting, but I got to say that um, this strikes me so so close to home. I spoke with uh, someone in another podcast uh, that I'm starting that uh, is a dancer. Um, and in fact, I don't think he'd mind my mentioning his name. Uh, it's Peter Sparling, uh, who was the lead dancer in Martha Graham Company and uh, Jose Limon and a major choreographer. And anyway, the reason I'm mentioning this is that he's also one of the most articulate people I've ever heard talk about anything especially dance. So most people think of dance sort of like a lot of our fundraising activity is something you do and you do it maybe to the music. And he said, no, no, no. He wasn't talking about fundraising. He was talking about dance, but he said, no, no, we kind of make the music work for what we do. And uh, we need to be able to express to others why it's important and articulate it in a way that they can understand. So it's not, we're just dancing, you know, like dancing bears for people. But in fact, they understand why we do what we do. Uh, so I love this piece because a lot of people don't understand fear or denigrate fundraising. And you've just given us all the reasons why, whether it's for our personal uh, evolution or for the evolution of our organizations, we need to be able to clearly articulate why we do what we do, why it's important, and how we need to work together. I love that. Yes. Well, thank you. And uh, couldn't agree more. And, and again, I'm hopeful that this section... Again, as you just uh, articulated, there's specificity to the communication skills and experience we need to have. The good news is that it, you can work on it. For those that are like, I hate public speaking, please don't make me do that. Then all right, well, let's, let's find a gradual path. Because if you want to be 
the senior position in your nonprofit, you're probably going to have to be more comfortable in that. And so we can work on it. Likewise, if writing is not a comfort level, let's figure out ways we can help you become at least competent. Um, so communication is a big one, and you said it very well. Um, the, the sixth, um, next to last one, is what I call build community. Um, the, the search committee is not going to hire you just to, because of your skills and experience in your current job. They're going to hire you because they expect you to manage their organization and also manage it outside of the walls, so to speak, of a single nonprofit. You need to demonstrate strategic networking skills because if not your board of directors, funders in your community are going to ask you, are you working with that other similar nonprofit in town? And so there, there's a whole, we could unpack that for days mm -hmm. in terms of, do you have kind of the wherewithal to understand alliances, mergers, uh, other types of nonprofit connectivity? And I would suggest that rather than getting uh, too complicated there, just maintain your networks, maintain your networks. I would tell everybody listening right now, who are two or three people you can connect with in the next month? that are in similar roles to you, that there's just some comparison value. What I always did when I first started Special Olympics, for example, I always tried to find three people that were aspirational peers and then intentionally net strategic networking as a result. So I'm, I'm new Special Olympics program director in North Carolina. I'm asking everybody, who are the best program directors in the United States? And invariably people will, you know, at the conference or wherever would say, oh yeah, you need to talk to Susan in Colorado or Jim up in Maine. Same names would emerge. I'd reach out to them. Hey, Susan, would you be willing to you know, get on a call with me for 40 minutes? I'd love to learn about your journey. But the mm -hmm. point is I was learning directly, but I was also building a network. And so that as we all advance, how are you strengthening your network? And I would suggest a simple exercise would be identify comparison peers, people that do your job in another organization aspirational peers. And then what we do in the masterminds, we say, all right, let's make a list over the next 12 months. You're going to connect with one a month, let's say, you know, mm -hmm. not outrageous. Guarantee your network improves. And then back to my original point, when you're interviewing for the job, your ability to say, look, I am very skilled at this organization, but I also understand the landscape in which we operate. Because I, I know people in different sectors and different communities and all that. And I think that is strong. And by the way, you were kind enough in our donor search friends were kind enough in this, the promotion of this episode, um, a personal board of directors is the ultimate goal that I have built and encourage others to consider. You're going to have lots of networking meetings, Jay, but five or six of these individuals may in fact become personal board members. And yeah. so there is a whole section in the book about how do you uh, identify the things that would help you in a personal board. And by the way, spoiler alert, just as your nonprofit strategically recruit certain skills and experiences on your board, that's how you should do it personally. As a program guy, I was not comfortable in the finance and business side. It scared mm -hmm. me, right? I did not, I was terrified if I would have to unpack the budget. So I made sure I recruited a buddy of mine who was an accountant in college and, and professionally, he's on my personal board. I take the report to him and say, all right, Cody was his name. Cody, explain to me what this report is coming out of the business office. And so again, example, yeah. I don't mean to elaborate too much, but the point is build a board that can help address areas that either of information you wanna gather, Maybe it's another community. If When somebody tells me, you know what, Pat, and I'm thinking about, you know, I'd love to someday get it to Atlanta, or I'd like to get to Los Angeles. I'm saying, all right, we need to find somebody on your board from that community giving you access. So personal board, Jay, I know some we left it up, but I wanted to make sure I at least offered a little explanation. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad you said that because uh, one thing that does frustrate me sometimes in our world is that the lack of definition. And people talk about mentorship. And mentorship can be great, but it's often not really well defined generally. You know, what does it mean? What shape does it take? How do I find a mentor? What is the what is the progress that we we want to match ourselves against? And by defining it a little differently, like this personal board of directors, aspirational peers who can fulfill it, 
or fill it. Um, that's that's remarkable. I mean, it's clear and it's also uh, a way to uh, understand how you can build a group of people who are going to be there on, in, at your at your side throughout your entire career. You're so right. And I think if we get in the habit of what I'm calling strategic networking, one or two a month, you will develop and some people will emerge like, wow, she was awesome. Yeah. Maybe she would consider mentoring me going forward. Not everybody, but there will be some strategic networking calls or Zooms that just you just click. Mm -hmm. And then maybe they become more than that. Maybe they join your board. And that's why in our mastermind program, we have each of the individuals connect for a networking call with each one other person between sessions. In essence, building that habit. And of sure. course, now I hope they've developed, you know, lifetime uh, connections uh, outside of their their community, their sector, their organization. But I think it's a skill that will pay off personally, and I would suggest it'll pay off professionally as you advance in your career. And we do have a question on that very subject. But before we get to the questions, I know you have one last item. Yeah. So practice leadership, in essence, right. um, there are a variety of topics that wrap it all together. But one I'd highlight uh, for the audience right now is. I think the best leaders coach and they are willing to be coached. So consider right now, do you have someone in your professional life that you would turn to as a coach? And if not, maybe that's something, Jay, like you just said, a mentor or coach figure. The best ones have a coach. I don't care how senior they are. I found the best ones continue to maintain some sort of coaching relationship in their life to help them get better, be accountable to them, et cetera. Also coach someone else, you know, I know you're stressed. I know you're busy, but there's someone more junior than you in your organization or outside that could use your help. And it's amazing how that sharpens your leadership skills to have to coach someone else. So I, and maybe another variation of that Jay would be for nonprofit leaders. Um, why not have an internship program if you don't have one now? Now, I realize there's some time and energy and maybe minimal cost, but you want to get that pipeline going and you want to personally sharpen your skills as a coach and a teacher and a leader, work with somebody. There are 300 plus nonprofit management, undergraduate and graduate programs in the United States, and that number is only growing. My point is there's a lot of emerging leaders coming out consider working with some of these students. I think you'll find it rewarding and frankly, also helpful to your pipeline development. Absolutely. Oh boy, we could speak about that all day. I, I, got your I, attention I love too, right? yeah. that. And, um, I do want to see if we can try to loop in a few questions. Um, and uh, so I'm going to try to go back a little bit and see if I can, but I know the one that came up right when you were talking about number six on the list, which again is about that community building is how do you build a new network outside of your community if you live Great in a question. very remote frontier community? Great question. Again, the only maybe the, the, the silver lining to the pandemic, I think, is an increased comfort with remote connectivity like we're in right now. And so I'm looking at Amy's question. You know, yes, LinkedIn is often a good starting point or other networking friends of a friend. Um, and then what I often do is say, hey, would you be willing to get on a 30 minute Zoom with me? Um, not as good maybe as an ultimate in-person meeting, but that, that let's look at it on the positive side. You yeah. all can connect with anybody, anywhere. I've even had now international networking mm -hmm. calls or Zooms. And so I, I think that that helps mitigate the, the challenges of being remote. It, it, and Patton, just for those of us who need specific instructions, what are the best things that you can communicate if you're reaching out to someone who doesn't necessarily know you well, or maybe not at all, in, in about why you want to meet with them. And then what is it you should take to that meeting so the meeting can be really productive for you and the person whose time you're Great. borrowing? Great point. Um, I literally suggest two or three key questions because you're right. If somebody's reaching out to me cold, I'm like, all right, what's going on here? You yeah. know, what am I getting into? Yeah. Be intentional. One uh, time frame. Hey, can I just spend 30 minutes and then be respectful of that time? Don't, don't drag it out if you promised a 30 or 45 minute. I think some of the best questions are number one, I'd love to learn from your journey. Would you be willing to share how you first got into our sector? There's always a good origin story for talented senior leaders, in my opinion, and, and they like to tell it. 
So say, I'd love to learn how you got into it, but maybe the, the follow-up question is what helped you early on, right? What resources, what ideas, what, what things, what decisions did you make that helped you advance? And then you can then parallel wherever you are. If you're brand new, you ask them, all right, what'd you do when you were brand new? How did you get to middle management? How did you get to senior management? That to me is an easy, you know, I'd call it the kind of career stage interview. When you got started, when you got to the middle, now that you're in the senior leadership, what is the biggest challenge you face right now and how are you dealing with it? You know, that to me, Jay, give them, you could give them maybe a question or two in your outreach so they know what's coming. And then maybe you have in your notes two or three follow-up questions. That to me is a powerful 30 or 45 minutes. You're respectful, you thank them. Do something nice for them to the extent you can, you know, celebrate their organization on your social media, lift them up when they are recognized. That makes it more of a mutual benefit than just, you know, you asking for a favor. But I hope right. that makes sense. It, it does. And in an era of ghosting, <laughs> whether yes. don't in be guilty dating of or that. friendship, don't be a ghost. No, yes. no Casper here. Um, yeah, that's, uh, it, I, I think that um, as we think about this, you know, I, I never asked you the thing I would ask you if we were having a, a podcast rather than a discussion on the subject of your book. And I'm glad we focused on it because you've shared so much. But um, you, a lot of people would do what you just said, which is to ask people about their journey. So maybe as we're kind of wrapping up, can you tell us a bit about how you got to this point, why you wrote this book, and then what you're imagining uh, people might be able to do with it as they hopefully go in and order a copy of this thing and get into the hands of their peers and, and take some of this to heart. Um, I'm, again, thank you for the opportunity. Grateful. Again, I feel like the book for me was both an opportunity to lift up outstanding leaders. Again, I use Mrs. Shriver, Eunice Kennedy Shriver as my kind of the North Star of someone who was just a fantastic leader and inspired me to get into a field that I thought was just going to be a summer internship and then I'll get a real quote, real job. And then it ultimately became a career. But the, the book then again was motivated, as I mentioned earlier, by I hope I can help someone who has the, the motivation and the inspiration to help our field, whatever in your sector is. But I want to give you a path. I just got tired of meeting talented people that said, Pat, and I'm out. You know, I'm frustrated mm -hmm. in my job. I don't see a path out. I don't see a path forward. And so my hope is that, all right, but let's, don't give up. The sector needs you. And so, you know, you and I were talking about, right, what do you do from here? And I guess if one, I hope if the book, if these concepts make sense, of course, I'd love for you to check the book out. But a few things you could talk about. Identify those three peers that Jay, you and I talked about for all those that are listening now. Who are those three contacts? We've all been isolated. Reach mm -hmm. out to somebody. Mm -hmm. Maybe somebody you hadn't connected with in a long time, or maybe someone you've never connected with, but you think there might be a mutual connection. Right. Um, I talk about in the book, this may get a chuckle out of some of those listening right now, um, plan a personal annual retreat. Plan your own personal annual retreat. I literally have an agenda for you in the book. <laughs> and again, some people might be like, what? What did he say? I'm like, no, I'm serious. You went on a retreat for your nonprofit. Give yourself the time and space to plan and think strategically. And when I do this, and I do this every year, you know, I think about just like the organizations do. I give myself some things to read before I go. You know, I get kind of warmed up to the concept. I do a self-assessment. I re revisit my mission, my vision, my goals. And I come away with three key goals for the year ahead, you know? And I, I just, I think that could be helpful to a lot of people that have things floating in their head, but maybe just haven't had a framework to maybe put it all down. And so that's something, Jay, maybe I'd leave this group with, something to think about. And again, I'm hopeful this will give them some encouragement to move their career forward. And maybe just one last time, tell people again where they can find you so they can- Patton, PattonMcDowell.com. Uh, check out the website. Again, you can find the book, the podcast, information about our mastermind program. If any of that is of interest, again, find me on LinkedIn email pm at pattonmcdowell.com. Uh, thank you so much for all this, Patton. Really do appreciate you. And I appreciate everybody's comments here. This is really great. I hope we've been able to weave in 
uh, many of your thoughts, if not all of them. I'm, I'm sorry we couldn't get to everyone. Uh, I do want to encourage you to come back. We have a discussion uh, on this Thursday uh, with Rhea Wong on people and, and how they deal with money, with the baggage they bring to the discussion of money. That was a very small facet we touched on today, but it's an important it underpinning yeah. of trying to figure out who we are and where we want to go. Uh, Patton obviously has given us a great um, uh, uh, you know, map for that. Uh, it's also good to, to be able to get Rhea's um, insights on the baggage we carry into, into this assignment of trying to figure things out. So I hope you'll join us for that. That's on Thursday at 3.30 p.m. Eastern. And we also have, of course, the podcast in this series, which we do, um, I think it's three times a month this year, and uh, lots of episodes where people just talking about their own personal origin story, which you just alluded yeah. to. So yeah. if you want to know how you can ask questions of people, don't use me as a model, but you can <laughs> you can at least listen to the podcast and see how people like to talk about themselves. And that's a rare privilege to have those kinds of conversations. So I hope you'll um, in, enjoy all of that. Please do, if you're not on the list, join the list over at DonorSearch, which is at DonorSearch.net, uh, where you can see all these programs, webcasts, webinars for CFRE credit, if you're collecting those things, and the podcast that's all available to you. 90 programs this year, so a lot of stuff. We want to hear from you on what you want to see and hear. Uh, and um, so uh, please do let us know. And, and you can always reach out to me individually. That's just at J, J A Y, at donorsearch.net. So take care of yourselves, everybody. Our thanks once again to the wonderful Pat McDowell. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you all next time. Till then, take care.